You're listening to Faces of Our Cities. I'm your host, Jesse. Today we're talking with Tiffany Duong. Tiffany and I have never actually met each other. This is our first time being on a phone call. And I've tracked Tiffany down through LinkedIn uh, when I was just looking for interesting guests to have on the show. When I saw Tiffany's editor, it just said something like, Explorer TV host or something like that, National Geographic Explorer. I don't remember exactly, but I was like, oh, this person seems super interesting. I didn't even know that these people actually existed. Tiffany agreed to accept my my connection request and agreed to, to hop on the show and so that we could meet her and get to know a bit more about her. So unfortunately, I don't have a great story about how we met Tiffany, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure one day we'll get that chance to to finally uh, tell a story about how we met. In the meantime, could you just help our guests understand who you are, where, where you're from, what you do, what makes Tiffany Tiffany? Absolutely. Um, so I love I love that question. I love all the different areas it could seep into. I think I'll start with. Uh, someone asked me what I would want on my tombstone once, and I said I would want it to say grateful badass and i think that captures who i am right i i live in i try to live in you know abundance and gratitude and all those like very woo woo we feel good things but they i mean they really do make you feel good and i try to live a life that makes me feel like a badass right it's my definition um and if that's what my tombstone says at the end, I'll be really happy. I picked those things um, because of kind of the journey my life has taken. So um, the two kind of biggest challenges I've had is my dad died when I was 17 and that was hard. It taught me that, you know, grief is the flip side of love. And it really gave me a profound understanding of like the light and dark of the human experience and how beautiful both can be. It gave me, you know, gratitude through pain. And then I used to have a job I hated so much. I now, like your, like my LinkedIn um, header said, I'm an explorer and an expedition storyteller. So I go on scientific expeditions into the jungle, on dive ships. I go to Antarctica in a month mm. to capture cutting edge science and conservation work and just like great stories and tell them so that the world knows sharing, like much like what you're doing on this podcast, sharing the human side of connecting to nature. So I write for newspapers, I write for magazines, I um, work to make little travel shorts and like just like j helping people jump into these amazing places. So that's my that's what I do right now, okay. and I love it so much. It doesn't feel like work, but in what was it? It's I think nine years ago I was a really unhappy lawyer in downtown LA, just hating my everyday everything and. Um, I was six years into practice. I was really good at it. And I just hated everything about it. I hated who I was. I hated what my life looked like. And I hated what my life would look like if I would continue. Mm. Um, it took everything in me to quit. And so that's why I say I would love to be a grateful badass at the end of my life. What kind of law did you practice? I was doing renewable energy project finance. So nice. writing the contracts behind those big wind turbine farms that you see on the hillsides or the big like solar panel arrays. So it was not, you know, soul sucking law by any means. It was, you know, pro climate change, helping the earth. But I felt like a glorified paper pusher who was just trapped in this concrete jail. Sure, sure. How long had you been thinking about leaving it before you actually made the move and, and, and took the leap? So I, on my very first day, I remember walking in in a suit that felt too tight and, you know, carrying an empty briefcase and like trying to walk the walk of a lawyer and thinking, I'm not going to last a year. Like, there's no way this could be for me. And 
And then it fast forward six years and I was still there because, you know, life happens and like there's a paycheck coming in and you have bills and, you know, you, you know, you're nervous about doing a good job. And so I don't think I ever thought I would stay, but then it just happened. And then I found myself caught in golden handcuffs of like, well, I like to go on trips or buy these things or do whatever, you know, have a nice house in downtown LA and all that costs so much money. And so I found myself actually in the opposite of how, how do I ever get out? Sure. Sure. I, I like these things too much to give them up. Like I, if I'm going to keep this, what other job could I have outside of being a lawyer? <laughs> Almost. Can you walk me through that, that day that you finally uh, decided, okay, like, we're going to cut this off. Was it, you know, nine months before the, the actual day that you gave your resignation or you walked out the doors? Did you take time to plan it? Or was it like you woke up on Monday and you're like, tomorrow is my last day and we'll figure this out. How did you go? How did you prepare for this, this exodus of a life that you have come to know and to really enjoy? It's one of my favorite stories about my life. Um, I was working late at night one day, um, 3 a.m. in the office, only person there, just, you know, slugging through hating life. And I got an email saying, you know, see the sea. And it was an invitation to a scuba diving trip to the Galapagos. And I was just, you know, I was in one of those moods and I was like, you know, F it, we're going. And I just like replied, I was like, okay, I'm in. And I didn't even think about it. You know, fast forward a couple months and I found myself in the Galapagos on a solo trip with nobody I knew, a really new diver, like far too new to have actually been going to the Galapagos in retrospect. And I just had like a soul moment on that ship. I was, at, when we were cruising out, there were, there was bioluminescent waves. There were dolphins jumping into that bioluminescent making it glow. There were more stars than you could imagine. There was a volcano. And I was just standing there bawling my eyes out. And I was feeling, in, now I see, like, so alive and feeling something I hadn't felt in 10 years of law school and legal practice. And my, I, I was anchored on that boat, on that bow, and I was just like, I can't believe I forgot what it feels like to be alive, you know, to have this much joy and feeling. I was so numb. And so um, that whole trip, I I basically just stood in that spot. I slept on the deck. I took my comforter up and I slept on a lawn chair. I was like, I need to be with the salt and the stars. I need to feel this as much as I can. And then I almost didn't come back. I was like going to become one of those, like, I'm just going to become a scuba diving boat girl. Like I'm going to, you know, forget LA, forget lawyer life. But I did go back. And the only way I let myself get on the plane was by promising nothing would ever be the same. So like the plane touched down in LAX and I didn't unbuckle. And I was just like, Tiff, like nothing will ever be the same. You have to promise. And that's the only way I let myself get off that plane. And a month later, I decided to quit without a plan, without a job, without really any thought other than like, I can't lose touch with that freedom that I had felt on the boat again. I feel like most people that we think of that would do something like that, they are not lawyers. They are not people with established careers that have tasted the finer things in life. They are people that are like, what else do I got going on? And and they go and become hippies and travel the world for a couple of years or months or whatever. And of the people that I've met, it's usually people straight out of college, right? Or maybe a couple of years into college and decided it wasn't for them and they start traveling the world. It's rare for me to meet someone who is a lawyer that was like, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to give this up and I'm just going to go into this yeah. without a plan because... Well, I would say the like Midwestern side of me says, Tiffany, you are way too brilliant to go into this without a plan. What are you, what are you thinking? Did you have people around you that thought you were crazy and tried to talk you out of it? Or for the most part, did you have a really supportive network that was like, yeah, man, if you need a couch, you got one. Both, all, none. Um, 
everyone thought I was a little crazy, but they knew I wasn't happy. So the loving part of them was like, okay, something needs to change. But they were like, why not go in-house? Why not just take a lesser legal job? And, you know, I, in my soul, I was like, full force, no, like we are, we are leaving, <laughs> we're done. And I, and so I had to learn to walk my own path and not check in with everyone who had helped me build that life up to that point for validation or for advice even because they couldn't see, you know, through the forest. They couldn't see where I could see. I could see the clearing, but they they didn't even see the forest. So there's no way I had to learn to trust myself and to try things without, you know, sit in the discomfort of not having certainty of of not being able, like people will be like, oh, great, you quit. What's next? And not having an answer to that is so uncomfortable. And like, I was weird about it for a long time. I, I, I would like skirt the question or like not try to meet people. So it took a lot of grappling to, to come to terms with myself and just be like, I'm still figuring it out. Like I didn't take this time when I was 22 to, to do the hippie thing and travel the world and figure it out. So now at 32, when I quit, I'm going to give myself that privilege. It's a weird time to do it, right? Once you pass 30s, yeah. there is this weird thing where people look at you weird like, oh, it's a midlife crisis, right? <laughs> Without getting too far into it, I just came back from about a year of traveling. I'm 38. And everyone that I met while I was traveling, they would be like, oh, you're like 27, 28 years old. And I think a lot of that, I don't think it's because I look young because I have a lot of gray hair. But I think a big part of that is that people just don't expect to meet like late 30 year olds giving it all up and travel. As you experienced your travels after that, what was first on your list of trying to figure out what to do? What did you start with? As I was quitting, one of my dear friends shared a podcast with me that was about dating. And it was basically like, why do we go on dates and, and think that, you know, like, oh, it went well, I'm going to marry him. Like, that's such a crazy jump, but we do it, right? And they said, like, if you really are just, like, striking out and not sure why things aren't going well, make a spreadsheet. and Go on 50 dates and use these as data points because you clearly don't, you're not picking right. You're not picking because you don't know what you are. So you are not allowed to actually choose someone to be serious with until you have 50 data points to actually calibrate, you know, your, your needs, wants, and standards. And so I applied that to my kind of job searching and I didn't call it a job search. I was just like exploration period to take the pressure off of, we got to find something. So whether that was like read a book, go talk to somebody who was doing something cool, you know, go try to intern somewhere in my thirties, I made myself do 50 things and the list went well beyond mm. 50. And it, and in this spreadsheet, I was like, okay, what was the thing? And what did I learn? So that even if it was like trying, I, I went to go live in the Amazon for a month because I wanted to try field work, the Amazon rainforest. And two weeks in, I was like, okay, I, I need a shower. I need a toilet. This is not my jam. But that was so valuable because I didn't waste time going back to school for science prereqs. I didn't go back to school for, you know, biology or marine biology, which I was toying with. I, I tried it. It became a data point. And then I was like, full stop, no, not going back to school for science. And so that data point helped me shift, right? And so I think that period, I got through it by just focusing on just like data points and not worrying about the outcomes, like not letting my mind trickle up into what this could become. Could this be a career? Could this be the answer? Um, and then also giving myself the freedom to not like things. Mm. Can you share some of, of those other experiences with us? Some of those other data points, like living in the Amazon was another one. What were some other things that you tried out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I volunteered with Street Child United, which is kind of like an Olympics for unhoused children around the world. So they bring um, youth from like the, the poorest cities, around the world together for a week so that they can discuss issues that they face universally. Mm. And then they can write like protocols to help inform their own governments. But then they host like a mini Olympics so that, you know, kids can play because they're kids. 
And so I volunteered with that while I was living in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, as part of my, you know, uh, when I quit, I moved to Rio. Okay. And then I stayed in Rio, then I moved to the Amazon. So I did this whole South America tour of finding myself and it was glorious. Um, so I tried that. I, I did the move to Rio just to, you know, feel joy every day, like walk to the beach, dance in the streets. Like it, if you can somehow swing that in your life, no matter what's going on, happy or sad, I fully recommend it. That sounds amazing. It was. Um, I tried running a boycott against sustainable seafood. And that sounds very like, you know, highbrow and fancy. But it entailed me wearing a shark costume and standing in front of Whole Foods and being like, don't eat the swordfish. It's unsustainably hot throughout, you know, California, driving up and down with a shark and a dolphin costume and making my friends do it with me, throwing nets on top of them and having them say like, no. Um, I wrote like legal comments to try to change international law. No, I've tried, like, I always say if it deals with the ocean and it's kind of weird, I've probably tried it. Um, I tried, I was the pizza, the underwater pizza delivery girl for a underwater hotel. So okay. you had to scuba dive to get in. Um, and so I was their like client support. And so I would dive a pizza down for them that they would order on the surface in a Pelican box so they could eat it at night. And we would dive down like steaks and baked potatoes and all that stuff. And eventually, like, doing all these things led me, um, yeah, no, I've I, done weird stuff. It's that, fun. I didn't even know that was a thing. That's incredible. It's in Key Largo, Florida. It's an underwater hotel. It's very cool. While I was at the shark costume boycott job, um, internship, not even job, I let myself do a ton of unpaid internships in my 30s, which most people are, like, you know, feel ego or shame about, but I was bent on not repeating my mistake and i wanted to do bite-sized tries how did you convince people to let you do that was that hard to convince businesses to let someone with a degree do that absolutely it was hard but i luckily everybody that was my supervisor was actually around my age at the time and so i was just like yeah i ended up in a job i hated and i don't want to leave before it's too late and i really need this skill set and they got it and they were so great, like the getting the position within these organizations just gave me a place to kind of park myself. Mm -hmm. But then they gave me free reign to be like, do you want to explore science communication? Do you want to explore scientific diving? What do you want to do? You know, do you want to be the shark costume girl? And so I got a lot of leeway to, you know, choose my own adventure within these places. Um, huh. So it's finding the right, you know, person to to help you grow in that stage. Um, but yeah, so then eventually I tried scientific diving by hauling myself and my scuba gear to Key Largo to work for a coral restoration group and to try like ocean field work. Cause I, you know, it, the Amazon wasn't enough to teach me. The ultimate one that really changed my life was finding a job on Instagram for another internship, um, at, in coral restoration and deciding to just go for it and moving to the Florida Keys to try, you know, scientific diving, because I still mm. just had a little bug, you know, I'm pretty stubborn. So I was just like, well, maybe it was the rainforest, maybe I want ocean field work. So I tried it. And um, I loved the keys, but I was still figuring it out. So I renewed my it was a four month contract, I renewed for another four months. And by the end of four months, oh. I realized, I don't want to go to, to back to school for sure, even if it's ocean, which is great but I love the keys. So, you know, that was six years ago. I was supposed to come back in four months and I just never did. And so now I call the keys home. Okay. I um, love the small community. I love having water around me, you know, 360 degrees. It just, it calms my soul in the same way that the boat did in the Galapagos. Mm, nice. I, I am with you. The keys are a really special place. I have friends that spent a couple of months down there, like 30 something year old friends that like are snowbirds, right? I've driven down to the Keys yep. and spent like a week down there. I think my skydiving picture on my LinkedIn is from skydiving in the Keys, which is just 
amazing. It's one of the most beautiful places. I mean, you can't skydive a better place. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's like number one or number two best places in the world to skydive, and it's beautiful. You're right. It doesn't surprise me that you decided to hunker down there and and call that home. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so you you've had these experiences. You've tried all these different things out. You decide to make the Florida Keys home. And what now you now you are have to decide how to make money. Now you have to figure out how to pay bills, right? And how many how many years were you doing internships for? That was two years into quitting. Okay. Two years into quitting, you're doing all this stuff. It was that about how long you kind of gave yourself, or did you put a time limit on yourself of how long you were going to explore, I guess, things? We like had the idea of like a year off because it's a neat little bow. But then in a year in, I was, you know, just coming back from Brazil and South America. And I was like, I am nowhere ready to interface with the world. So I took off that time limit, which did not make people around me happy because they were like, we gave you, a, you know, like a year to sort of like, you know, be lost and figure yourself out. And I was like, well, it's not that easy, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I was just like, I'm just going to take the spreadsheet approach and just keep going until I find something that resonates. So I took the pressure off myself. So it's like a year of travel, a year of internships. When I was interning as a um, coral restoration scientific diver, I was at an event in the Keys and I was talking to a friend about, you know, conservation. And this guy in line behind me to try free tacos was like, hey. Sounds like you know some stuff about the environment. I was like, I could probably. And he was like, would you want to write about it? And I was like, I could. Well, who are you? And he turned out to be the new editor of the local newspaper. And he was trying to build up a staff. And so I was like, sure, I'll try it. And he was like, I can pay you. And I was like, oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. And so through that opportunity, I learned to like, become a journalist basically and to become a photojournalist and a written journalist and take stories for the local paper and I loved it so much I felt like I mean it's much probably what you feel like with this podcast like I just get to talk to people about why they're cool tag along with them you know tromp through the Everglades go on a dive and like tell their story and then they're so grateful the readers like write to me and are like oh my god this person's amazing and I'm like I know and so I was just like, wow, this is a job. And so that's how I found kind of storytelling as a career. Like I told, like I got lucky that we were both going for free tacos. And now I'm assuming you still do that to a certain extent or no, or did that run its course? It's evolved. I still write for that paper, but during the pandemic, I picked up a bunch of other clients, different magazines, different, a lot, mostly dive focus. And um, since then, cause that was, what, like four, this will be four years from that mm -hmm. point. Um, since then, I've kind of evolved what I'm offering as a service. And I've had to think of myself as a business, right? Not just as like a writer and artist. But um, so I do all those storytelling, like writings, but I also create like media packages for scientists who are doing cool research or for travel bureaus who, you know, need to showcase a destination. So you know, last year, I was lucky enough to be brought over to Jamaica. The year before was um, Saba and Grenada um, to dive and tell people about those oceans. Cool. So it's kind of packing together a career that, you know, I did not know existed that I probably made up, but that makes me like so stoked to be me every day. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so happy for you and, and so happy that the journey to get there was as exciting as it probably could be. It looks like on your LinkedIn, you're freelancing and that's kind of what you like call it as. It's still a business of you. You don't have any employees. Are there plans for that? Are you interested in building a business where you have people or are you like, no, this is it. Like, I like this at least for the next like five years until I get a new itch. Nothing is ever set. I've learned that about myself. I actually have like a mini team right now that helps me with some social content for some clients. They're super great. Um, so they like help make videos or posts or whatever, but I'm shifting 
into some like really cool new projects. Like all of last year, I made a VR video game um, off of one of my expeditions with people that I met on expedition about life as an orca in Norway. And we won a big United Nations award and a couple film festivals. And so now we're all going to the Antarctic together to make a second game. And all of that is kind of passion project right now, but we're trying to convert that into, you know, a sustainable kind of life. I never want to work for someone else again, because I love being a ping pong. I like being able to like, be like, I want to wake up and do yoga, or I want to sleep in, or, you know, make a grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah. Or I want to, you know, kick ass and write this story. Like, I want to choose my life. Yeah. Um, so I could never work for myself again, but I love working in teams. Mm, cool. Cool. Yeah, I saw that Orca thing yeah. on your LinkedIn, and I was really excited to hear about that. I'm glad that you talked about that. And I'm assuming that's the trip that you're talking about in a month that you're going back. We went to the Arctic before, now we're going to Antarctica. Got it. Got it. Okay. Wow, that is so much more than I even expected to learn about you. I honestly, I, I saw that you had gone to law school, but assumed you just like got lucky and became an explorer. So I'm so excited to hear that whole story of, of how it came to be and to know that there's so much more there than what your LinkedIn lets anyone see. <laughs> the story of how you got there really is inspiring, I think, especially because we hear about silent quitting or we just hear about people just being so unhappy mm -hmm. and the amount of like random cookie businesses or like freelance stuff or fractional like CMOs or CFOs or or just fractional whatever, just people trying to just pick and choose and like find their own way and have more yeah. control of, over their life. Yeah. Um, it's inspiring to meet someone who who recognized that and has gone down the path and is is in the middle of it. So thank you for sharing that. Of course. When you think about these experiences, if there were two or three life hacks that you could give people from all of these experiences, whether it's like go to whatever taco restaurant, taco truck in the keys for free jobs what what life hacks would you give us <laughs> absolutely this this was my favorite of your questions i love life hacks um so the first is from a writer called mark manson he wrote the subtle art of not giving a fuck mm -hmm. um i don't know if you know that book he's a yep. great writer he has a mini article that is basically about thinking about work as a shit sandwich, right? I think when we're, especially if you, like, when I found this article, I was like, I want a career that's exciting and outdoors, but pays me, but I'm home, but, you know, and like all the things, all the, you know, dream list. And that article brought me back to reality. And it was like, there will always be challenging things about every work, right? That's life, that's work. And you can't aim for it to be cookie cutter perfect. But like, so remember that work is a shit sandwich, but you get to pick what flavor of shit you want to eat every day, right? And yeah. having that mindset really has helped me approach building my own life in a different way. So whenever I mentor people, I tell them like, instead of saying like, I want to be X, Y, or Z, like, think about what you want your day to feel like, what you want it to look like, right? That's your flavor. Mm -hmm. Decide what flavor you're gonna eat and then you can figure out what kind of sandwich you're building. That's number one. Okay. Number two is um, something that I just did this year. Uh, I learned it on Instagram um, from someone named Darrell Bailey, but he does a annual couples strategy meeting with his wife. So I did it with my boyfriend, okay. but you could do it with a friend. You could do it with yourself. It's basically at the beginning of the year, you know, when you're all sparkly eyed and like full of resolutions, sit down and have very honest conversations about finances, travel, personal goal for you, for them, professional goal, you, them, health, wellness, relationships, whatever's important categories for you actually like treat it like a business meeting, right? They go to like a WeWork space. We went to the local library and we sat for five, six hours and talked through all the, we like brainstormed apart and then we discussed together how to make 
this year work for us individually and then as a couple. And I thought that was so fun. It really helped me as I was mapping out my year and to see like, okay, and you know, they give you feedback like that. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to be in Germany in July and then Italy in August, but home in the middle. So then it helped me, you know, pick and choose and prioritize and really focus. So that was number two. I loved it so much. Mm, um, I like that. And the last one is one that I am not good at yet, but that I know that I need to work on. It's a Warren Buffett rule. So he says, write down your 25 goals for the year and then circle the top five, right? Those are your A list. That's your like top goals. Everything else is your B list. And what we tend to do is think like, it's okay if we're like aiming for the A list, but we're chipping away at the B list. But he said, you need to avoid the B list at all costs mm. because that is actually your biggest distraction from A. Like if A is truly your, you know, A list, don't waste time on the Bs because you'll, it seems like a good thing, but you're actually just taking away time and effort and good creative juice from solving all your A things. So I'm not great at that yet. Like I let emails sneak in or like, oh, that would be a great opportunity. Just answer. But I am trying hard to focus on my A-list, you know, like making my next video game with my team. Where does being a guest on a random podcast come in? Is that somewhere in the C and D list? And and how do we make no. sure that we stay in the at least B list two years from now for a check-in? No, it's an A list because it's that that's paying myself first, right? That's that's taking care of my like advertising of myself and helping me to have a check-in with myself. I love being a guest on a podcast, so I'd be happy to check in. Cool. Awesome. Well, that's awesome to hear. Thank you so much uh for for those tidbits and those those life hacks. I am curious about number two. Have Yes. You don't have to give us super granular details, but yeah. Thinking about relationships that you had where you didn't do this check-in and now you're in a one where you do do this check-in. Was this the first year that you've done that with your partner? Have you been doing it for a couple of mm -hmm. years and you're like, yep, this is going so much better than all those other relationships. What like, yeah, give us, Give us a little detail there, would you? This is my first time doing it. I just found it on Instagram because it was going a little viral. I've been with this partner for 10 years. We just had our 10 year um, on January 7th. And then we did this check-in on January 8th. So we we know each other's tendencies and like pitfalls and like, you know, flavors. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, how do we make this year different? Like, how do we, you know, we're both at a point where we're we're trying to launch into new aspects of our careers. He, when I quit law, I, we were newly dating and I was like, Hey, I like where this is going, but I'm going to move to Rio and be a totally different person. If you like, like where this is too, you'll have to come with me. And so he quit his job at the same time. We did this whole journey together, Whoa. And, which has been awesome. And so he, um, he's now trying to get into a different field just as I'm kind of evolving also. So it's how do we support each other while we're doing such different things, but still wanting to be together. And it really, it, it helps so much to be like, okay, you know, maybe in May we can both go to Atlanta, you know, when you're filming and, and spend like a weekend together and do a mid-year check-in, mm -hmm. things like that. Cool. I'm so excited to check in a couple of years from now and see how this goal has been working for you versus the first nine years, 10 years, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I will say that it left us both feeling more aligned with each other and like the where we wanted to go than we have been in 10 years. So like even just the exercise of it already, we were like, oh, like this could really help. Mm. Cool. Cool. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us as a guest. And I can't wait to check in with you uh, a couple of years from now or maybe a year from now. We'll see how it goes and follow up and see what other life hacks you've learned that you're willing to share with us. Of course, it's been such a joy. Thank you.